the fundamental issue in American politics today, I think, is the contest between majority and minority rule, where the rule of minorities is facilitated by the system and a system that changes that and turns elections into majority rule really is a big threat to some established ways of doing politics. You're listening to the USSC Briefing Room, a podcast from the United States Study Centre at the University of Sydney, where we give you a seat at the table for a USSC briefing on the latest developments in US news and foreign policy. We'll cover what you need to know and what's beneath the surface of the news. All right, my name is Jared Monshine, and welcome to another episode of The Briefing Room at the, from the U.S. Study Center at the University of Sydney. Before we get started today, I want to first acknowledge the categorical people of the UR Nation, pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Professor Ben Ryder. He joins us as a non-resident fellow at the U.S. Study Center and an adjunct senior fellow, fellow at the East-West Center in Hawaii, and he focuses on electoral reform and the design of political institutions in the United States, Australia, and parts of Asia. And he has worked on, in and around Australian foreign policy for a number of years. And before we get started, Ben, I just wanted to confirm you have a stat or figure to share with us at the end of the episode. Is that right? I do, Jerry. Excellent. Do. Thank you for coming prepared. So, Ben, as someone who has worked in and around not only Australia and the United States, could you just give us a quick lay of the land on what what it means when you, we talk about electoral reform, especially in the United States? You've you've been working on on these issues. You've studied these issues. What what, what does that actually mean, electoral reform? Yeah, well, it's a good question because in the United States. Unlike in Australia and most other countries, when you're talking about electoral reform, you're really talking about the state level. There's not a lot that goes on nationally. The, the US Congress has the ability to write election laws for, uh, that are uniform across the country, but has, uh, has mostly declined to do that. So there's only a very few requirements uh, that. Uh, Congress stipulates, and everything else is handed over to the states. And what that means is that in the classic formulation, the the 50 states in the US are the laboratories of democracy, and uh, they can take democracy uh, in positive directions, they can expand the franchise, they can make uh, more responsive, more representative systems, but they can also do the exact opposite. They can restrict those things. They can uh, make minority rule rather than majority rule the order of the day. And I think we're seeing that playing out right now across the United States in different states. And so in those differences, what what are the key states that you're seeing um, that change? I, I, for example, have, have lived in a few places in the US and it just so happens that I am now a main voter. So my ballot has, has is, looks very different than it, it looked, you know, maybe uh, 20 years ago. Um, what exactly are the states um, doing and, and which states in particular are, are you talking about that are doing maybe the most uh, significant reforms? Right. So uh, you're from Maine. I'm a voter in Maine. I don't the, know if I'm from Maine, the, but yes. The, pi- the Pine State, right? Is that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I remember when I went to Maine a few years ago and I was like, wow, this place reminds me of somewhere on Canada yeah because it's just yeah um, pine trees as far as the eye can see so Maine of course was the leading uh, exponent of what has become a bit of a movement in the United States today which is a shift towards what is being called ranked choice voting in America what we would call preferential voting here in Australia and I know it's the ability to give giving voters the ability not just to to vote for one candidate and all or nothing, as is the case in most of the country today, but to actually say, all right, if you can't have your first choice, who would your second choice be? And this, this is, you know, or your third choice and so on. And this, you know, most Australians, we're so used to this system, we don't even think about it. But How old America, is it in Australia? Uh, we've been using it for over 100 years. Wow. And even longer in some states. And it's just become part of the fabric of politics and it's pretty widely accepted. 
But that's not the case in the US. It's become highly politicized and the political class of both parties, but I think particularly on the Republican side, see this as a kind of existential threat because if you use ranked choice voting, as they call it in America, preferential voting as we call it, one of the things that that requires is that the winning candidate has an absolute majority, either outright or after those second and third rankings get counted if they need to be counted. And the fundamental issue in American politics today, I think, is the, the contest between majority and minority rule. In other words, there are many aspects of American politics, and some of these are actually built into the, the Constitution itself, um, where the rule of minorities is facilitated by the system. And a system that changes that and turns elections into majority rule uh, really is a big threat to some established ways of doing politics. For example, uh, the MAGA side of the Republican Party seem to particularly dislike this reform. So we've seen uh, states like Maine uh, and Alaska uh, recently introduce this reform with it's going to be an initiative ballot option in, the, uh, in November, in Nevada, in Oregon, possibly in, in Arizona, possibly in Colorado. But at the same time, this exact reform has also been banned in a bunch of states, Florida, the Dakotas. Missouri has an initiative ballot coming up in November to ban this system. And there's a pretty clear partisan divide. I mean, most of the states that are trying to ban this reform are Republican states. Now, Alaska, which did introduce it, is, is probably a Republican state too, historically, mostly, but much more of a purple state. And I think this is part of a trend where as the United States, as some states within the US shift becoming less clearly red or blue and more purple, these sorts of reforms become very attractive to voters, but they're also a big threat to the established political class. So this is one of the things we're going to see playing out this November. I think the other thing or the, the broader context in which this is playing out is, is initiative ballots themselves. We're going to be seeing a lot of initiative ballots on uh, uh, initiative proposals on ballots this November. And I think part of the reason that's happening is that there isn't great enthusiasm for the two main parties. There isn't great enthusiasm for the two main presidential candidates. As we know, um, they're in, on most indicators, most surveys suggest they're the two least popular major party nominees in living memory, Biden and Trump. Only 80% of Americans don't want them to run. So <laughs> that's drawing 20%. Yeah, so exactly. So what can you do to gin up a bit of uh, turnout and get people to actually get excited about the election? Well, one thing you can do in about half of, I think, 26 of the 50 US states have some right to a sort of citizens-initiated vote on a particular issue. And these are becoming pretty popular. It looks like we're going to have a lot of, uh, of initiative questions on ballots in those 26 states. And I think listeners will not be surprised to hear that issues like abortion rights are going to be popular. Uh, citizenship, weirdly, is, is popular because citizenship, of course, is a national issue, not a state issue. But nonetheless, can, a states lot of can't states, do anything about it, but they want, in a, 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 they want a statewide vote on it. There is a lot of performative, mm. theatrical gesturing about um, essentially about restricting the vote to US citizens, which is already the case. Right. But uh, in quite a few states, there are initiative ballots. It's so like virtue signaling. Exactly, virtue signaling. And uh, as I was mentioning earlier, another area of initiative ballots is this, it's an opportunity to change the rules of the political game. So we're seeing that. So um, Arizona, for example, is going to have an initiative ballot on whether the primary system should be opened up or kept closed. Um, uh, Nevada is going to have an initiative ballot on whether they should switch to 
a so-called top five open primary and ranked choice voting. Um, there's going to be a bunch of, of, of other topics um, on the initiative ballot, um, in, you know, this, this November. And I think when we start to look into that, it helps us get a bit of an insight into the sorts of issues that are really topical for American voters today, because to actually get on the ballot, you have to do a lot of work. You have to get a lot of signatures. You normally need to have a lot of money behind you. So it's a good insight into the sorts of issues that really do motivate American voters. I, w- I want to talk more about those issues. But first, I want to know, in the states that have ranked choice um, voting, um, what have the results been thus far? Well, so you've got two states that have used ranked choice voting, Maine and Alaska. The biggest impact so far in both of those states has been a shift from uh, electing relatively extremist uh, representatives, uh, members of Congress, governors, in the case of Maine in particular, towards more centrist, moderate representatives. And that makes sense because if you think about it, if you need to get an absolute majority to win, and as a politician, you've got an eye out not just to getting votes from your supporters, but maybe picking up some second rank, second preferences from people who initially voted for someone else that might flow back to you in the count. Well, how do you do that? What's the best way to attract those votes? The best way to attract those votes is to be a relative centrist, someone who can appeal across partisan divisions, not someone who is a, you know, a, a real hardliner, because if you are a real hardliner, uh, you know, us versus them, you're not going to attract many preferences from people who voted for someone else initially. So Marjorie Taylor Greene is not a, probably not going to be a fan of Richard's voting. Marjorie Taylor Greene is the exact kind of politician who would be threatened by this reform. And, uh, Exact, that's exactly right, Jared. Her style of politics would be much more difficult. And this is, this is actually how things played out very much in Alaska. You remember Sarah Palin, yes. uh, who made a comeback uh, bid at the Alaska um, uh, congressional election, actually, seeking to become Alaska's uh, sole representative in the U.S., House of Representatives. Now, she has a lot of name recognition. She's a Republican. Uh, You know, she had advantages going in, but it turns out that she's also very polarizing. And polarizing candidates struggle to win under this system. A much uh, less polarizing, more accommodative candidate, Mary Peltola, who's also a Democrat, but who was actually doing deals with Republicans to sort of try and get some joint initiatives going, ended up winning that seat. And I think that shows the potential of this reform to really shift American politics from this highly polarised direction uh, that, you know, we're seeing in much of the country today towards, you know, not, it's not going to necessarily be... Um, it's not a magic bullet, but it just changes the incentives for politicians and helps moderates who are committed to some degree of bipartisanship to get elected and then to do their thing. Uh, you know, so it's like a, a return to politics uh, or how it used to be maybe 20, 30 years ago. But it also, beyond the uh, congressional districts, there's uh, also, I think, it's notable in terms of the, the Senate representation in those states as well, right? Right. Uh, well, Maine has always had relatively centrist senators, always, in recent times. Angus King and um, Susan Collins. Susan Collins. Um, so that, in a way, that hasn't changed. Uh, but uh, it certainly changed in Alaska. Lisa Murkowski was... Uh, no big fan of Trump. No big fan of Trump and was really not going to survive the primary process until these rules got changed in Alaska. And the change to open primaries and ranked choice voting meant that Lisa Murkowski was able to stay in Congress. And actually, she ended up in her her election getting 70% of preference flows from the excluded Democrat candidate in her race. So that just goes to show the the power of this kind of reform that, that, that people who voted for the Democrats were then able to say, all right, if we can't have our Democrat, which of these, there were two Republicans standing, do we want? And one of them was MAGA. 
and one of them was MAGA and one of them was Lisa Murkowski and 70% said Murkowski, thank you. So that just shows, and that, that was the difference between winning and losing the election. So that just show, shows the kinds of impacts that this reform can have. As I said, it's going to be on the ballot in other places. Uh, Nevada has already actually voted to adopt this reform, but under their constitution needs to vote again. So um, Two statewide we'll referenda. Yeah, yeah, over, over four years. The exact same question twice. The exact same question twice. And quite a few states actually have these sorts of provisions. Um, and that actually, that's, you know, a good lead into this issue of ballot initiatives because as I mentioned, there's all sorts of issues that historically get put to voters, not just these election reform issues, but, but things that voters really care about more, uh, minimum pay rights, abortion access, uh, marijuana legis- you know, legalization has been, has been popular, <laughs> property taxes, always a big one. In, Especially in, the, in the blue policy. states. Right. Um, but now a number of states have... And again, unfortunately, this is mostly in the red states, uh, have decided that this is a danger, allowing voters to, to choose policies on this issue. So how do you fix that? Well, you put up an initiative referendum to change initiative referendums. Ah. And that's now become the new battleground in a bunch of states. Um, Missouri has been... Uh, a particularly active exponent of this, uh, Ohio, Arkansas, and Florida. There's all these attempts now to restrict the ability of voters to use these popular initiatives to get the sort of changes that it appears that they want. Have there is it like a record in terms of popular ballot initiatives? Like in terms, is it, it seems like. You know the the popularity of politicians and the popularity of Congress um, just seems to be decreasing. As you said, there's a lot of just disinterest in in the two leading presidential candidates. So it seems like um, a lot of people, like you said, um, are are going to these ballot initiatives. And so, are we seeing a record level? Um, are are we just is this a, a grassroots movement that is sort of um, unprecedented, or is or do we go through cycles? I think this goes through cycles. Um, there are, there are. We don't know is the short answer because the signatures are still being collected in some states mm. to get uh, uh, questions on the ballot. But we do know that the reproductive abortion rights issues, uh, in particular, is driving a lot of uh, of, of potential questions um, and potential uh, initiative ballots. And um, as I said, the, the uh, citizenship issue broadly defined, but sometimes there are also, you know, much more niche issues. There was a particular question. I mentioned Missouri as being, you know, a, a, an egregious example of using, attempting to limit the ability of voters to make changes. And I think this is a good example. Um, Missouri apart from other things, is the puppy mill capital of America. I did not know that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, puppy mills as in mass industrial scale breeding of, of dogs, of puppies for sale, but often in um, not great conditions and often yeah. forcing, you know, the uh, bitch dogs to stay continually pregnant and, you know, a whole range of issues that concern people. So, in 2011, Missouri residents voted to essentially shut down puppy mills. It turned out that they were taking on big puppy, as it's called. <laughs> I'm not joking here. Okay. So, you know, you, we know big farmer, right, yeah. big oil, big food. Well, it turns out in Missouri, big puppy has a vote, a lot of money in the puppy industry. So, what did the puppy industry do, the puppy mill industry? They got a, a then senator, Mike Parson, uh, to introduce legislation to overturn the people's popular vote. And it turned out that the legislature did overturn this popular initiative. And then they realized, great, well, we can do this. So people voted a few le- years later to uh, expand Medicare. No, the, legislator, the, the legislature voted to, to, um, to nix that as well. And now they're taking this next step of trying to make initiative ballots themselves much more difficult 
to initiate and much more difficult to win by all sorts of technical things, you know, making higher signature requirements, making it a requirement that you get a certain number of signatures in every county in the state rather than just across the state, all sorts of tricks to try and limit the ability of voters to get what they want. And I think this is, this is a bit of an insight into American politics today, that there is a war going on at the national level, but also at the state level, and then at this subterranean level via, you know, policy questions on initiative ballots, that, that, the, but, that there is a common thread, which is, is this, uh, is, is our big questions of politics going to be determined by the majority will of the population, or is minority rule going to triumph? And um, unfortunately, in some states, it's very clear that minority rule at present is triumphing. The combination of gerrymandered districts, the lack of ranked choice voting, so plurality voting, as we call it, uh, closed party primaries, limitations on the ability of voters to take steps via you know, popular initiatives and so on, is all about securing the power of a, a, what is clearly a minority position uh, uh, and often, sadly to say, it, it does. It's not. It's not just Republicans who have done this, but today it's it's clearly more on the Republican side than the Democratic side. Who are the the Democrats that have been fighting against this? Or are the, what are the instances of, of Democrats that that um, have not wanted to um, adhere to to this uh, sort of popular vote? Well, I mean, <laughs> Democrats, as I said, have not supported the ranked choice voting reforms. Democrats, Some have. As, as a party, uh, have, the Democrats have traditionally been wary of this because it changes, particularly in states where they're winning, because mm. they tend not to, to want to mess with success. Democrats have campaigned against gerrymandering reforms in some states where they are the benefits of a gerrymander. They, That's right. I think the former attorney general for Barack Obama, Eric Holder, has an initiative fighting gerrymandering, I believe. Um, what do you, it, it has, well, if it's in Illinois, there that would be an example, right? They're the beneficiaries there. They're the beneficiaries of a, of a egregious gerrymander in Nevada. So, you know, they've fought against independent redistricting. So the Democrats are not uh, you know, it would be nice if we could just say, you know, um, here are the good guys and here are the bad guys, but it isn't that way. Pox on both houses. Not a pox on both houses. There is an unequal uh, element to it, but it's not just, it's not the case that one side is pure and lily white. Not at all. Um, but having said all that, uh, the kinds of restrictions that are on, on majority rule that I'm talking about, uh, much more common today in what we might think of as red states than in blue states. Now, in terms of um, the political political aspects of this, it seems like the um, Biden, Biden campaign and Democrats really want to get abortion on every ballot they possibly can because they think that drives out the vote. Do you think that um, that is a once-off or are we going to continue to see these sort of ballot initiatives on both sides trying to drive out the vote, whether it be the, like you said, virtue signaling on statewide um, citizenship things that might get more conservatives, or, or whether it be abortion, abortion issues that get more progressives. Do you, do you think this is something that we can expect to see a lot more of? I think, look, the abortion issue clearly is a big driver of turnout, but we, in some states, that's already happened. So some states have already made those changes. Uh, but it is going to be in a couple of battleground states like Arizona. It's clearly going to be the abortion access, along with some of these other hot button issues, are driving uh, the um, uh, initiative ballots. Um, California has been sort of the home of this sort of uh, uh, citizens initiated ballot reforms. Not exactly uh, a swing state, though. Not exactly a swing state. So, you know, I don't think it tracks exactly on the, 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 key, the key states and um, because only half of the US states have, have, the, have the right to have these citizens initiated ballots in the first place. That's a progressive era reform that, you know, it got taken up in the West, in parts of the Northeast, but not so much in, you know, the Midwest or, or the South. So, Gotcha. All right. 
So we're at the point of the program where I would love to hear your stat or figure um, that you've prepared for us today. All right. So the, the, today's stat is 100, 107. And 107 is the number as of today, May 19, uh, statewide ballot measures that have been certified uh, for the November 2024 election. Uh, I think there will actually be more. I think this is um, a number that is going to rise. Um, but uh, it's the fact that we've got so many at this relatively early stage in the cycle, I think, tells us that there is a real clamour for a way, a, a way of reforming politics and getting new p- public policy issues onto the agenda that does not take place through the traditional legislative process because you have a polarised gridlock, gridlock system in nationally and in many states, so voters are looking for other ways to affect change. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Professor Riley. Um, as we wrap up, I'd like to point out a couple of other podcasts that may be of interest. Our CEO, Michael Green, is co-host of the Asia Chessboard podcast with Jude Blanchett, the Freeman Chair in China Studies at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'd also like to recommend checking out our USC Live podcast series, which runs recordings from our major live events, including the panel discussions from our inaugural Sydney International Strategy Forum. You can find these on our website, ussc.edu.au or wherever you get your podcasts.